are done. <laughs> Makes funny jokes about food. He, he plays water balloons and he throws them on my lap. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Tells me a joke. He scares me and that was. My someone said that would be funny about what's taking to me. That was who would make funny things for that. Wrestles me. <laughs> Speaks with different accents. Good for us. Good for us. Um, well, there's this one thing that really annoyed me, but it turned out to be funny. He kept his mustache for my softball pictures, and then he let me shave it off two days after the softball pictures. It was really annoying. That's what it is. At least I got to shave his mustache off. <laughs> um, wrestle on the couch. Play games. I said he just wide balloons on me last and that's funny. That is stunning. Mm -hmm. Get a tree and go to like stores and look around. Read books. I'm going to the golf store. Go out for lunch. Uh, go to the zoo. Get lunch together. Just. Help us at Starbucks. <laughs> he hooks me. He hugs me and is kind to me. I like this. He hugs me. He plays with us a lot. I don't know. Um, my dad just loves me all the time. Because he gives me hugs and kisses every night. When we have fun together. Because he's me. Um, by spending time with me and giving me hugs and kisses. Um, when he's trying to go to sleep, I sit on him. <laughs> I tell him funny jokes. Um, um, I say, hey daddy, ooh, 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 ooh. then he laughs. <laughs> um, scare him. Scare him. Do something silly. When, when, when I have a funny face. Tell jokes. Tell jokes. Make funny jokes. Um, I scare him. To scare him? Yeah. I'll hide around a corner. Or 
when he's reading to my brother at night, I will go, I'll go up above the book and I'll scare him. Morning, friends. Good to see you guys. Thanks for being here at Midtown with us today. Uh, you guys, growing up, I lived a fairly comfortable life. Didn't have a ton of hardship. I had an immediate family who loved me really well, an extended family that loved me well. I was relatively successful in things like sports and school and the rest. All of the kind of stereotypical childhood joys existed for me. Uh, but all of that changed on one brutal day, uh, my junior year of high school. Uh, in the middle of September, when all things in our world are starting to pass away, uh, we learned that my 54-year-old father uh, had pancreatic cancer. It's one of the fastest moving and deadliest diseases in the human body. And I can still remember uh, the room where we got the diagnosis. My dad was laying on the hospital bed. He had that perfectly vulnerable hospital gown and was enveloped in confusion. Uh, he had only been experiencing symptoms for a couple weeks at that point. Uh, but this sort of cancer uh, doesn't wait around. And my mom was sitting just adjacent to him in a chair. My brother and I were at the bed, at the foot of the bed. And I was feeling things in that moment that I had never felt to that point in my life. I didn't have language for it. It was like this inner groan, like a river that flowed in every contour of my chest. And I couldn't find words to describe it. And so I decided to get up. I walked out of the hospital room and started to pace up and down the hallway, seeing if I could find my emotions, my words there. And I didn't. And so at one point, I just stopped my walking. I turned over to the hallway, faced the wall, put my hands on the railing there, looking down. And after a few moments, I lifted my leg back, and I kicked the wall as hard as I could. Out of anger, out of grief, out of loss, out of all of the emotions that I was feeling that I didn't have words for, I lashed out. And I'd like to tell you I put a hole in the wall. I didn't. <laughs> Shout out to all of the hospital architects and engineers. Structural integrity, on point, in the hospitals. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have words to respond. I didn't know how to deal with this sort of suffering. And while that moment was a particularly painful one in my own story, I also know that every single person in this room has their own kicking the wall sort of story. You guys have been through pain and suffering in ways that I can't even begin to understand, comprehend. It's a universal part of the human condition. And we live in a time and place right now that doesn't really know what to do with it. Suffering and pain are things that our American culture doesn't teach us to handle very well. Sometimes we're taught to ignore it or escape it. That's one of our favorite strategies in the US. We live in a time of unprecedented comfort, unprecedented access to things that make us feel good. And on top of that, we're often taught that if we act the right way, we work hard, we treat people the right way, that things will go well for us. And so when we encounter pain and suffering, it's utterly disorienting. We don't know what to do with the ambiguity, with the uncomfortability of that. So we try to escape it or ignore it or numb it away. We drug, we drink, we distract ourselves, all in an effort to feel good again. And the result is that we become people who don't know how to reckon well with pain. There's actually a, a doctor who wrote about this not long ago. His name is Paul Brand. He was an orthopedic surgeon who traveled all over the world. He spent lots of time in particularly impoverished nations, caring for people who were going through the worst of suffering. And he started to, as he returned to the US, compare some of his experiences abroad with America. And he had some fascinating observations. He put them down in a book called Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants. He said this. After the war, I moved to India, just as partition was tearing that nation apart. In that land, of poverty and omnipresent suffering, I learned that pain can be borne with dignity. It was there, too, that I began treating leprosy patients, social pariahs whose tragedy stems from the absence of physical pain. In the US, though, a nation whose war for independence was fought in part to guarantee a right to the pursuit of happiness, I encountered a society that seeks to avoid distress at all costs. Patients lived at a greater comfort level than any I had previously treated, but they seemed far less equipped to handle suffering and far more traumatized by it. Avoidance and escapism do not work to help us deal with pain, friends. So sometimes we go to another strategy. Sometimes we try to soften our suffering or pain. We use lots of platitudes 
to help ourselves through it, right? You guys have heard all of these at one point or another, I'm sure. Every cloud has a silver lining, right? As if that got rid of the cloud, right? That's the edge of the cloud. What about the cloud? The cloud's still there. It could be worse. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, no, that really helps validate my pain and helps me walk through what I'm walking through. It could be worse, you're right. Everything happens for a reason, right guys? Inspiring, social media platitudes. You can see the sunset in the background and the font over the sunset. Everything happens for a reason, right? That's really a way of minimizing pain, pushing it away so we don't have to deal with it, as if some reason would validate what I'm going through. Friends, suffering, our suffering with platitudes doesn't help us deal with it. In fact, it oftentimes adds to the pain by minimizing it. And so sometimes we jump to a third strategy in our culture. We try to make suffering into a good thing. I remember watching a news story a few years back that stuck with me ever since. It talked about this tragedy of a drunk driver who struck a car, injured the parents really badly, but killed their little daughter. And because of that accident, some elements of public policy were changed in the state where it happened. And on the TV news broadcast, the anchor said something I'll never forget. It stuck with me. He said, this little girl did not die in vain. Now, do you see what's subtly happening in that statement? It's trying to make the tragedy into a good thing. As if her death is somehow good because some public policy changed as a result. It's good that public policy changed. That's a good thing. But public policy does not bring that little girl back. Public policy does not cure the hearts of her parents. No matter how hard we try to twist it, our suffering and pain is not good. Friends, suffering is the universal human experience, and yet our common ways of dealing with it are failing us. And it leaves many of us in this room, I've talked with many of you, in the face of our tragedies and pains, wondering, what can we do with it? How do we respond well to it? Uh, this morning, in our final installment in this series we're calling God Let Loose, uh, we're going to explore the way Christianity answers that sort of question. It does it by giving us a pathway through it, not around it. That's a unique part of the Christian story. We have a God in Christ who does not avoid suffering or try to escape it. We have a God in Christ who does not soften suffering. We have a God in Christ who does not make suffering a good thing. We have a God in Christ who enters into suffering and charts a way to healing through it. And today we see that one way Christ does that is through the Holy Spirit whose presence in our lives gives us this vision and this power for life that enables us to navigate the pain and suffering in a way that transcends all of the faulty narratives our culture gives us. So friends, if you have a Bible, open it with me. Now to the book of Romans. We're we'll in Romans chapter 8 today. Romans is near the backs of your Bibles, right in the middle of your New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. The words will be behind me on the screen, so you can follow along there as well. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Uh, you guys, humans want answers. We want to solve things. In fact, we want to solve things so badly that in our leisure time, we will make up stuff for ourselves to solve. You masochists who do puzzles know what I mean in the room. Right? And if it's not puzzles, it's riddles. And if it's not riddles, it's like Tobin Keck's Rubik's Cubes, right? <laughs> I will mess this up just to resolve it again and again and again and again and again, right? And that's a good tendency in our humanity, but sometimes we carry that into our suffering and pain. We ask questions like, why? I want to resolve this. I want an answer to this. Why is this happening to me? Why is this going on in my life? We want an answer. We want a solution. And again, that is a good thing. There's passages all over this text that remind us that asking why questions is an essential part of being human. Just look through the Psalms. This poetic prayer book that teaches followers of God has done that for thousands of years. How we relate to God gives us all sorts of templates for why questions. Psalm 2, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? Psalm 10, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are words that Jesus himself uttered. And so if you're in this room and you're questioning where God is in the middle of pain or suffering, that's okay. In fact, it's not just okay. It's something that the Bible encourages you to do. God welcomes your why. And sometimes, the scriptures give us an answer to why. Sometimes we learn that suffering and pain comes about because humans made bad choices. Sometimes we've made bad choices, sometimes others around us have, and that brings pain and suffering into our own hearts and into the world. We also know that sometimes suffering and pain happen because there is an enemy spiritual force at work in the world. There's another team on the field. And sometimes that team is pulling us away from the source of life and flourishing, is pulling others away from the source of life and flourishing. We get some answers. But here's the truth, you guys. The Bible does not have one catch-all answer to why. No one has a catch-all answer to why. There's certain suffering that we will never fully be able to solve. And that's true whether or not you're a Christian. If you leave God and Jesus behind, you reject God, why questions still exist? Good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people, and we can't make sense of any of it. Which is maybe the hardest part of suffering for many of us, because that's often when we resort to platitudes. Suffering and pain expose our finitude. They remind us that we, as humans, don't have a comprehensive picture of the universe. And that bums us out, because we want one. We want answers. Suffering and pain are the ultimate humbling reminders that we don't have as large a picture of the world and the universe as we'd like. As scholar Kate Ballard put it, there's no cure for being human. And so Paul, in the passage we just read in Romans 8, he's shifting the focus away from the why question. He's not saying the why questions are bad. He knows they're in here. But he's more interested in answering a different question in this passage. What do we do with our pain and suffering? If those experiences are universal and no one has a catch-all answer to why, he wants to explore how we can deal with our pain in such a way that it can produce abiding life and peace and joy in us. And he gives us a response here. It's twofold. We need both of these things in tandem in our lives if we're going to deal with our suffering well. He says we need to learn to groan in the spirit and we need to learn to hope in the spirit. Groan in the spirit and hope in the spirit. First, groaning. You might have noticed Paul uses that word numerous times in this passage. It's this highly emotive word. It refers to that deep inner turmoil in your soul that arises when you encounter pain or suffering. That same thing I felt when I learned my dad's diagnosis. That same thing that you have felt in a multitude of times in your life. And he mentions that that happens in a couple different places, that type of groaning. First, he mentions that it happens in creation. He says the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. Paul's revealing a crucial thing here that we often neglect when we think about the story of God. He's reminding us that this story, the work of Jesus, involves the whole of creation. See, many of us have been given by churches or by our culture this narrow, individualized picture of religion and Christianity, a picture that says the whole goal is to escape sufferings and get beyond this world. But that's not the story the scriptures tell. And Paul knows it. Paul knows the story of the Bible is a story that starts with a good creation and ends with a renewed creation. A story that begins with a flourishing world, one that works harmoniously together, where spiritual and material reality live in perfect connection with one another. 
and where humans are shaped uniquely in the image of God to steward creation in loving care, to give of themselves out of love of God in all things rather than to take for themselves as kings and queens of the universe. And the result of that perfectly wired creation is something that is thoroughly connected and integrated. Every little piece works in tandem with every other little piece. The puzzle people get excited again about that. It's this beautiful piece of loving mutuality and dependency. But the tragedy of the story is that us, all humans, in our own ways have decided not to participate in that mutuality and dependency. We've all decided to take for ourselves rather than give of ourselves, to define life and flourishing on our own terms as kings and queens of the world. And so that means we've all acted in ways that harm rather than heal. That's what the Bible means by sin. It's the condition that leads us to use our freedom, not to love God and love creation as we were made, but to take and use for our own purposes at the expense of God and others and creation. So we become people who lust and objectify instead of love and dignify. We become people who envy rather than celebrate, people who take rather than give, people who dominate rather than serve. And because we've done that, Paul says that the whole creation has been thrown out of whack. See, our actions are not just isolated and individualized. They ripple out into the world in such a way that now the creation itself has been fractured. Things don't work the way they should. That's what Paul means when he says the creation was subjected to futility. He's saying the world isn't functioning as it was designed. And as a result, it is groaning, longing for restoration. And you actually don't have to look very far around our world to see our creation groaning. Back in 2019, there was a report released by an organization called IPBES. IPBES stands for Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services which is why they have an acronym and go by their acronym. Right? But this report, 1,500 pages, sponsored by the UN. It includes thousands of studies done by hundreds of scientists from more than 130 countries. Sweeping examination, maybe the most sweeping that we've ever done about our Earth's ecosystems. Here's some of the high points or low points. Since 1870, 50%, half of the world's live coral reefs have been lost. In multiple major land habitats, including the African savanna and South American Amazon, native plant and animal life has decreased by 20% in the last 100 years alone. If those trends continue, within the next 100 years, we might see the loss of all forests on Earth. Marine plastic pollution has increased tenfold since 1980. It's resulted in the stark decline of 86% of marine turtles. That's why people care about the turtles. 44% of marine seabirds, 43% of marine mammal life all of which affect food chains that lead right up to you and I's doorsteps. You guys, right now, there is a garbage patch floating in the Pacific Ocean. It's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It is 620,000 square miles. That's twice the size of the state of Texas. Our creation is groaning. Our ecology is longing, awaiting restoration. But it's not just our creation that groans. Humanity also groans. Paul says here, not only the creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. You guys, every one of us has some part of our life over which we need to groan. We all have some part of our existence that is longing for life and healing to come in this world of death and decay. Maybe for you it's a broken relationship or a lost loved one. Maybe for you, it's a body that doesn't work the way that it ought to. Maybe for you, it's missing a good thing that you long for but don't have yet in your life. Maybe it's groaning over a mind and heart subject to depression or anxiety or fear. And what Paul is telling us here is that we need to pay attention to our groans. We need to listen to them. Because when we do, we recognize something essential. Our pains are reminders that something is off in the world. Our suffering is like an alarm that wakes us up to the truth that we and our world need healing. And so Christians become people who deal with pain through prayer in the spirit, not platitudes. That's what we've always meant by lament as Christians throughout the centuries. We must mourn our losses. We can't talk or act them away. We can't soften them or turn them into good things. We shed tears over them. We allow ourselves to grieve deeply because to grieve is to allow our pain to break open our hearts and remind us that we are needy people, dependent people. 
And when we do this well, we find a shocking and scandalous truth, Paul says. We find that God is present there with us. Paul says that deep within our souls, often buried below our distracted modes of living, the spirit of God is present within our groanings already. That's what he means when he says the spirit helps us in our weakness, intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. He's saying that in Christ, our groanings, our sufferings, our pains are the places in which we encounter the life-giving spirit of God. That's where we find a God who endures the pain alongside us, who knows our pain so deeply that his spirit can give voice to it in ways we can't even begin to articulate. This is a God who's willing to enter every part of the human condition to find us, to love us, to shape us, even in the darkness. This is a God who, as the psalmist said, keeps our tears in a bottle, who knows and cares for every one of us and who is undeniably for us. This is a Jesus who wept at the tomb of Lazarus, who endured the cross, who gave himself over to the very pains that we experience in order to chart a path to healing. And it's a spirit who groans with us and for us in the deepest parts of who we are. And somehow, in the midst of our tears and groans, the first steps of the dance towards life take place. Our pains are not where God is absent. They are often where we begin to experience his life-giving presence. There's an exercise that I practice with some of our leaders here at Midtown that has helped me come to terms with this in my own life. Uh, we call it a life map or a life exegesis. And basically, you start by taking 30 to 50 post-it notes. And you write on those 30 to 50 post-it notes events, people, or moments in your life that have been particularly formative or significant for you. Once you've written all those down, then you go through a second time and you take pink post-it notes. And you replace all of the moments that you wrote down that were particularly painful with a pink post-it note and rewrite it on those pink post-it notes. And inevitably what happens is that there's a good amount of pink scattered throughout. Sometimes there's even seasons of pink, long stretches of pain. And then the third thing we do is we take a marker. And next to each of those uh, parts of our story, we indicate where our character or our values most matured, where we grew and developed the most. And inevitably, friends, not, not entirely, but inevitably a large majority of the pink post-it notes are where you star where you've grown the most. They're where you star your character, your values, your personhood has developed the most. Every time I've done this, that's been the case for people. Now that doesn't mean the pain is good. It's not, that's not the view of Christians. Christians are not masochists. The pain and suffering we endure is part of the broken world, not a part of God's good design. But when we lament it, when we listen well to our pains, when we pay attention to the pink post-it notes, what we often see is that something has arisen out of them that has been particularly formative for us. That those things somehow have been used to create and shape people of health and life if we listen well. That's how God works. That's the catastrophic poetry of the cross. It's what makes Christianity so incredibly radical that even the utter tragedy, even the unspeakable pain of searing loss is something that God enters into and works through to produce something new makes new life. And that actually points us to the second thing that Paul tells us here about how we deal with suffering well. We certainly groan, but our groaning isn't the end of the story. And notice the phrase that Paul uses here to describe the groaning in the spirit. He says it's like labor pains. He's implying a birth, the arrival of a new life on the other side of suffering. Labor pains indicate something new and remarkable. And all the moms in the room today, you know this well the most painful thing that you've endured, the most difficult thing you've made your way through has produced something so beautiful and so transcendently glorious that it somehow helps you deal with the pain that got you there. New life is born in the world on the other side of labor, something so infinitely precious that it will warm your heart in such a way that the suffering can feel sometimes incomparable to the beauty and goodness of the new life in front of you. What Paul is saying is that while we certainly navigate suffering by groaning, we also do it as a mother does for a child, with an intimate hope, a knowledge that some sort of life is growing in us and some sort of life is going to be birthed through us. We become people who hope in the Spirit. Hope is the thread that runs through this whole passage for Paul. He says that we have a future hope in Christ, a new life being birthed into our broken lives and world. 
a life with such glory and goodness and beauty that the sufferings are incomparable to it. And hope is one of those words that we've sometimes minimized. We don't understand it very well. In our culture, it's become ambiguous for many of us. It's kind of wishful pie-in-the-sky thinking, but that's not how the Bible or Paul understand hope. It's a bad understanding. The sort of hope that Paul is talking about here is deep and profound. Hoping in the Spirit is a trust in a future reality that transforms our present. Trust in a future reality that transforms our present. I want to break down each of those small points. First, it's a future reality. Paul uses the imagery of adoption to communicate that here. He says, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You've received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, so that we may also be glorified with him. Glory. That image of adoption that Paul's using is something his ancient readers would have understood pretty well. Back in the first century Roman world, homes and families were dominated by the father, the patriarch, which made adoption a really difficult thing. Even into adulthood, fathers had rule over their children. So if you were adopted into a new family, it meant the release of your father's authority over you and the acceptance into a new family where new rules, new reign, new life would come to you. In the ancient world, it meant all rights of the old family were left behind and all rights in the new family were adopted. It meant one would become a full heir to the new family's estate. Even if more kids were born, you did not lose any of your inheritance. And it meant that the past of the adopted person was completely wiped out. It meant debts were canceled. It meant their history was left behind. It meant they were regarded as new people upon which the past no longer had any hold. Paul's saying that's precisely what's happened to us in Christ. We have become people whose identities have been fundamentally changed. The decaying and broken world passing away around us no longer has defining power. Our inner brokenness and anxiety and fear no longer have defining power. We have been adopted into a new eternal family and now only Christ has defining power. His life becomes our life. We inherit what he has. And if you want to know what that inheritance looks like, well, just look at Jesus. It looks like abiding peace. It looks like deep and abundant joy. It looks like the defeat of death. It looks looks like life lived forever in a renewed creation where tears are wiped away, where justice comes for all, and where we live and talk and eat and drink and dance and laugh in a world of abundance. That's glory, friends, and it sounds reasonably glorious to me. So our hope, it's in a future reality, and that kind of future reality hope is necessary for us if we're to face down the circumstances we see in our lives. We need a confidence that can transcend changing circumstances. We need something that goes beyond what's right in front of our eyes. This sort of future hope is the only way life can have any meaning. There's another doctor who wrote about this. One of the greatest books written in the 20th century. It's called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. He was a physician who lived through the Holocaust and survived it. So after the Holocaust, he did a lot of thinking about What is it that enabled people to make it through this sort of abject pain and suffering? What helped people do this well? And remember, he's a doctor. So he considered physical traits. He considered mental traits. He considered emotional traits. But he actually found that the people that were most equipped to endure suffering, endure the camps, the trait that they had was not physical strength. And it wasn't access to the best food or nutrients. He said it was hope. Hope in a future beyond the camp. Here's how he put it. He said, if a prisoner lost hope in his future, he was doomed. One of my friends in the camp had a dream that the war would end March 30th. He was convinced that the dream was a revelation. But as the date drew near, it became clear from the news reports that the war was not ending. And so on March 29th, he began running a temperature. On March 30th, he lost consciousness. On March 31st, he was dead. His loss of hope had lowered his body's resistance to all of the diseases in the camp. Life in a concentration camp exposes your soul's foundation. Only a few of the prisoners were able to keep their full inner liberty and strength. Life only has meaning in any circumstances if we have a hope that neither suffering circumstances nor death itself can destroy. If we have a hope that neither suffering circumstances or death itself can destroy. 
That's precisely why you see people in the exact same circumstances, friends, fold up in one case and thrive in another. Because it's not about the circumstances. It's about the future they hope in. And that future changes their now, which points to the second part of this definition of hope. It transforms our present. Now, Paul uses another image here that would have been really familiar to his first century audience. He refers to how we've received the first fruits of the Spirit in Christ. And the mention of the first fruits is a callback to an ancient Jewish practice. When harvest season would come, the people would immediately give to God the first and the best crops of their harvest as a sort of deposit to indicate what was to come and what they trusted God would bring. What Paul is saying is that in Christ we receive the Holy Spirit. It's a sort of deposit that indicates what is to come, which means the future reality of Christ starts to work now as we wait for the harvest. He says that Jesus has opened up a portal to the future. Jesus has dragged the future reality of God's flourishing and life into the present, into and through us, so that we can begin to experience it now. Which means every time we embrace the way of Jesus in our lives, we begin to experience the Spirit, by the Spirit, the goodness and life and fullness that is to come in Jesus. The now becomes an appetizer for the entree of eternity. And so when we fill the bellies of the hungry, it's not just a nice moral thing to do. It is the beginning taste of a divine table that never runs out of food and is open to all to come and eat. When we forgive others, it's not just something we do because our parents told us to forgive our siblings. It's the beginning taste of a divine love that welcomes and heals and has grace for all. When we gather together to pray and share and care for one another, it's not just a nice, fun social activity. It's the beginning taste of an eternity of shared joy and peace and life together. When we're pierced by wonder and rapturous beauty, by some artistic or natural wonder, it's not just some psychological reaction. It's the beginning taste of a never-ending wonder in the presence of all that is good and beautiful and true. Friends, by the Spirit, in us and in this sort of community, Jesus is dragging the glorious future into the now moment by moment, person by person. That's what the church is supposed to look like, an outpost of the coming kingdom here in our midst. It's where heaven and earth get unified now. It's no surprise to you that I have a Frederick Buechner quote to express this well. Frederick Buechner put it this way. He said, if only we had eyes to see and ears to hear and wits to understand, we would know that the kingdom of God in the sense of holiness, goodness, beauty, is as close as breathing and is crying out to be born within ourselves and within the world. We would know that the kingdom of God is what we, all of us, hunger for above all other things, even when we don't know its name or realize that it's what we're starving to death for. The kingdom of God is where our best dreams come from and our truest prayers. We glimpse it at those moments when we find ourselves being better than we are and wiser than we know. We catch sight of it when at some moment of crisis, a strength seems to come to us that is greater than our own. The kingdom of God is where we belong. It is home, and whether we realize it or not, I think we are, all of us, homesick for it. Hope transforms our present, friends. And finally, hope is about trust. Hope is only as strong as the thing or the person in which we trust to satisfy. And the truth is we're all trusting in something. We have all entrusted our lives to something that we hope will give us ultimate meaning or significance or peace. And so many of the things we entrust our lives to fail to bring us the satisfaction we want them to. We trust material comfort to bring us lasting peace and security, and as a result, we become anxious people, fearful people at every economic turn, or utterly terrified of losing what we have. We trust beauty and youth to bring us happiness, and we die a million little deaths with every new wrinkle and every joint that aches. We trust a relationship to bring us lasting joy and are defeated by any loss or breakup or absence. Trust in any circumstantial part of life will fail us sooner or later because circumstances change. Father, we pray for uh, whatever emergency is happening down the street, the suffering and pain of our neighbors. We pray that you would be with them. You would give them peace, that you would give our first responders strength to respond well uh, to whatever emergency is happening. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul, friends, in this passage says there is one worth trusting. There is one who can deliver true hope. It's the one who brings the spirit of adoption, not fear. 
the one who redeems humanity and creation from their groaning and opens a pathway to life, the one true child of God, the one who lived the life that we were made to live but have all failed to do. It's the one who took on true death in his true life. It is Christ. And when we look to Jesus and entrust our lives to him, when we hope in him, when we allow our hearts to be softened by his compassion, by his love, by his mercy, by his justice, by his beauty, by his peace, by his cross and resurrection, what we find is that real hope starts to pervade our lives. What we find right in the midst of our groaning is the presence of God and the fullness of life precisely there. The Spirit of God meets us not at the peak of our aptitude, not when we've solved all our problems, but when we realize we have a need. On December 7th, 2011, uh, my father passed away. And I remember the day. I remember my mom calling me into his room. I remember watching his last breaths. And I remember groaning. I remember crying out to God. I remember hugging and sobbing with my family and close friends, but I also remember something else. I remember a strange otherworldly presence of God in the room and in the home with me, as if God himself hugged and cried with me. I remember the love of the spirit of God and the friends and family members who brought us meals, who visited us. And I remember feeling a profound sense of peace in the most gut-wrenching time of my life. And I can't break that down for you scientifically. I can't explain it away rationally. I can't give an answer for why any of it has happened, but what I can tell you is this. The Spirit of God was with me in my groaning. He's with all who groan with him. Hope is there in the middle of suffering. And friends, what Jesus offers isn't a catch-all answer. What he offers is himself. His very Spirit with us and for us and shaping us towards glory. His very spirit dragging that glorious future into our lives and communities bit by bit. His very spirit charting a way through pain in such a way that it brings us life. So wherever you are, trust him with your labor pains. Trust him in your groaning. Because true, lasting, eternal life awaits you precisely there. Let's pray, friends.